all the way back, okay? And um, Ronald let me know the other day, a couple weeks ago, he said, now Jody, he said, I mark off every verse that you've preached uh, and used in your sermons since you've been here. Uh, and he said, some of them you're starting to go over twice. And I said, well, um, I took that as I need to find new content, all right? So I thought about that this week. He didn't know I was going to think about that, but uh, uh, I thought about that this week. He's keeping, a, he's keeping a keen eye on me, all right, to make sure I'm not slipping. And I thought, well, God, you know, I don't want to disappoint Ronald or anybody else uh, by using the same verse. So I, I, I said, well, I tell you what, you know, let's go all the way back, all right, to the very beginning when there was only two people on earth, okay? Now, you might have had a week to where you wish you were still in that earth where there was only two people, but now we've increased mightily, of course, and that was God's design. He told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply, and that we have done, okay? And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that later on. But Genesis chapter 3 and verse 9. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 9. What has happened? Well, the creation of all the world that we know, the Bible says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That was the very first verse that we have in the Bible. And this is where the God spoke, said, let there be light. God created the division of waters and God uh, formed the seas and the stars and the moon and uh, the greater light by day, the lesser light by night. We know that as the sun and the moon. God looked over the earth after six days, uh, and he said it is good. And then on the seventh day, we know that God rested. That will take up Genesis chapter 1 and even some of Genesis chapter 2 as we come into the creation of man. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 that God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And then we see... Uh, in verse 7, how that he did that, he breathed into nostrils, uh, into man's nostrils, the breath of life, and the Bible says that man became a living soul. And then there was a rule, okay? So before we get to Genesis chapter 3 and verse 9, I want you to turn this morning to Genesis chapter 2, and I want you to look at verse 16 and 17, actually verse 15, 16, and 17. Sarah's not going to put this up on the screen. She shouldn't. It's not a mistake. She didn't have this, okay? But I just want to bring you to where we are this morning, and I'm also going to show you a picture and kind of uh, bring everything into context before that we read uh, the actual text, okay? So in Genesis chapter 2, the Bible says this in verse 15, the Lord God took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. He gave him a job, okay? There's work for, er for all of us. We are put here not to be idle, but to be workers. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou, that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Okay? God would go on to create woman out of the rib of man, we know all of that. That's all very familiar to us. But now we've got a rule. We have a commandment of God that says, be fruitful and multiply, work, till the ground, keep it, dress the Garden of Eden that I have given to you. It was a perfect setting, okay? But there was one thing that God said, Adam, here is the one thing. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, we come to chapter 3, all right? And in chapter 3 of Genesis, we look at verse 9. The Bible says, And the Lord God called unto Adam and said, Where art thou? Where are you? God spoke to Adam, whom he had created in the short term, and now he's coming to him and saying, Where are you? Well, what has happened between God's creation of man and him breathing into his nostrils, nostrils the breath of life and man become a living soul? He gives him a job to do, a task to do, and then he says, don't do this. And now, just a few verses later, we're saying where that the Bible says that here come the presence of God, okay? And he says unto man, where are, well, I'm going to say, where are you? But God said, 
where art thou? Same thing, it's just we don't speak, where art thou, son? We say, where are you? And that's what God said to Adam and Eve, where are you? Now, I want you to look at this picture of Peyton yesterday. This is probably in all of his debut of sports. To me, this is probably the best picture we've had so far, okay? And yesterday, Peyton got called for his first flag, first penalty, okay? And the penalty was holding because Peyton was set up as a wide receiver and he runs downfield about five yards, and he gets tangled up, okay, with the cornerback, who's the defensive man against him. And then they get tangled up. And the play is coming around. The running, running back is coming around Peyton. And Peyton's getting tangled up with his guy. It's a good thing. But then, all of a sudden, the, the kid falls to the ground. And Peyton jumps on top of him. <laughs> and the flag comes hurling at Peyton. Lands near his feet, and you could hear the referee say, holding on number five. And when they call number five, Peyton knew, that's me. And he's been tore up about it ever since. Matter of fact, I called him last night. He went home with mom after the game, and he was going to stay with her. And I called, I said, where's Peyton? He said, hello. I said, Peyton, I just want to let you know, I thought today was the best game that you've played this year. And he said, but I got that flag. And he could not shake it that he, that he heard his number in a negative way when they said, holding on number five. Well, this is later in the game, and him and that boy, I, I, I don't know who little number three was, but believe it or not, he was actually smaller than Peyton. And they were battling it out the whole game, and sometimes I'd see Peyton fall to the ground, and sometimes I'd see number three fall to the ground, and Cassie just happened to get a picture of the time where they were near the end zone. They were running a very similar play, and Peyton comes up, and he nails this kid, and immediately, what did he do? He learned his lesson. He held his hands up. And any time you hold your hands up, what are you? Guilty. You know? Because why else would you hold your hands up if you're not guilty? Okay? And so Peyton wanted it to be made very clear that when the umpire seen him this time and he seen number three laying on the ground, I'm not holding him. He got down there all by himself. I'm not holding him. And so if we go back to verse 9 of chapter 3, we find where here comes God. And when God comes, everybody either, well, in this situation, they ran. And why would they run and why would they hide? The same reason that Peyton threw his hands up. Because he wanted to prove that he was not guilty. Well, one telltale sign if your kid is doing something wrong, if you've raised kids before, and most of us have, that when you walk into a room where they're by themselves, and if you walk in and they take off running, Chances are you're going to find a mess. And that was the same situation to where in chapter 3 we see very early on that the serpent is described as the most subtle than any of the beasts of the field. And he convinced Eve that eating of the forbidden fruit was not that big of a deal. Matter of fact, he even told her that God had said this, but what God didn't want her to know was that if she would eat of the forbidden fruit, it would be actually better for her. The Bible says that Eve ate of the forbidden fruit. And not only that, but she went and got Adam. And Adam also eat of the forbidden fruit. And then that's where we find where that in verse 8, the Bible says they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Why? Because they knew they were guilty. Well, I want to go to two verses just right real quick this morning because if I said to you, if I gave a quiz and I said, okay, fill this word in. If I said, you reap what you, and I put a blank, all of us know 
that it's you reap what you sow. Well, that's not an adage that we get from nature. It's not that the garden has taught us that. It's not that the farmer's almanac has taught us that. It's that the Word of God says that to be a fact. Is that you and I, we do reap what we sow. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6 says, Paul said to the church, He which soweth sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. You reap what you sow. See, we don't preach a lot of sermons about offerings and tithings and, and all those givings and all that. I, I just I feel like that if God's blessed you, then you ought to bring in of the blessings that He has blessed you and give. And if you'll do that, He'll bless you. Now, if you want to be a tightwad about it, you want to be a cheapskate with your tithes and offerings, then God will be a cheapskate when it comes to your blessings. Amen? That's a 30-second sermon on offering, and that's all we need to say. Be faithful to God, and He will reward you with more than you could ever give Him. And so we see evidence of that in your life and all of our lives when we have opened up, and by faith we've given even when it hurts because we know it's good to do, and God has blessed us more than we could ever imagine. Because we reap what we sow. And in Galatians chapter 6, the Bible even gets more serious about this whole idea of us reaping what we sow. And it says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. God is not mocked. For whatsoever you sow, that you will also reap. God knows what you've sown, and that you will reap. You can't hide it from God. That's why I gave you these two verses. You say, why, why these two verses? And how does this somehow go back to Genesis chapter 3? Because I'm telling you that the reason God was in the presence of Adam and Eve during this particular time was because He already knew. He didn't need their explanation. He didn't need to put them on trial. He didn't need to, a judge and a jury. He already knew what had happened. And so I want you to look at this quote. I, 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 Matthew Henry, I've used some of his uh, words for many years, and this is no exception when he said, those who are willing to take the pleasure and profit of sin are backward to take the blame and shame of it. Those of us who oftentimes in our sin have been so proud and boastful to take the, pre the pleasure and the profit of our sin, yet when God shows up, we are backward and we don't want to take the blame and shame of it. We hold up our hands as if it wasn't me, God, knowing good and well that it was. How do I know that I've been guilty? How do I know that you've been guilty? How do I know that in those times that we have held up our hands or that we have ran and we've hid behind the bushes as Adam and Eve did? How do I know that we were guilty? Is it because we held up our hands? Is it because we hid behind the bushes? No, it's because the Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so don't come to me this morning and say, Jody, uh, this sermon wasn't for me. I've never been guilty. That's just not true, my friend. You might, think you're the, you, you might think you're the cream of the crop. You're the A+. Plus. You're the high society. But I'm telling you that you're a sinner. He said, I didn't come to church for you to tell me that. Yeah, you did. Yes, you did. You knew when you come here you was going to get the truth. The Bible says that we're all sinners and that we need to be saved. We've all come short of the glory of God. You knew I was going to tell you the truth. What is the truth? Is that we're all sinners. Just as Adam and Eve sinned, the Bible says we've all sinned. Don't blame Adam and Eve and say, well, I would have never done what they did. Yes, you, yes, you would have because you have. Amen? Now, what does sin do? Well, sin separates us from God. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 10, And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. That's what I, Adam said. Adam said, when I heard God speak, when I heard you coming, God, I was afraid. I was afraid because I was naked, and I went and I hid myself. Now, go back to the quote that Matthew Henry said is that those that take pleasure and profit in sin 
oftentimes are backward to take the blame and shame of the sin. When you get caught, you don't want to take the blame and the shame of it. There's been a lot of people who have been proud and boastful in their sin, but when they got arrested and they're standing in front of that thing at the jail that tells everybody how tall you are, now all of a sudden, what are you going to have to take? You're going to have to take the blame and shame of it. See, just a few hours before, you were enjoying the pleasure and profit of sin, but now as you're standing humiliated, caught, busted, guilty, now you're taking the blame and shame of it. What does sin do? It takes us outside of the will of God and it separates us from His loving presence. It separates us from His peace that He offers to us. It separates us from the joy unspeakable and full of glory. It separates us from our happiness. You're not getting a good night's sleep at night. Get the sin out of your life. Amen? You want your marriage to be blessed? Quit running around. I mean, it's, it's a pretty simple deal. I mean, if you put sin in your life, then you the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 2, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God. Now your sin is between you and God. And the relationship between you and God is not what it could be and not what it should be because now you've got sin in the middle. And your sins have hid His face from you that He will not hear. So sin creates this barrier of sorts between us and God. I looked, and I, I didn't know this. I think this is the first time I'd ever inquired about this. Some of you are a lot smarter than I am, maybe already knew the answer to this and have already looked at this, but how many people have ever lived? Do you know the answer to that? How many people have ever lived? I mean, from the start. We started with how many? One. Okay. We started with one, and by Genesis chapter 3, we've got two. Now, men don't look and say we should have stuck with one. No. <laughs> we got the man, the man, and then we got the one. We started with two. And I went and I done a little research. And there's all kinds of answers, but many of them come to the conclusion that we're somewhere now over 100 billion people have lived since the two. Okay? A little over 100 billion people have lived. Right now there's about 7 billion people in the world, which makes up, I think, somewhere, like they say, that right now 7% of all the people that have lived are living right now. And that's supposed to increase over the next 20 years or so. So you, and the reason I thought about, I thought about me. You know, sometimes I may think I'm somebody, but in the grand scheme of things, when you're one out of 100 billion, are you really that much? You know? I mean, you might walk around and think you're somebody and everybody's looking at you and everybody wants you, but, that, but at the end of the day, you're one of 100 billion. I, I used to have some things uh, that my uh, papa had collected over... Uh, the years, and, and well, I still do. It wasn't like I sold them or anything, but some of those, he, he had some knives that they only made annually, and they only made so many of them. And you wanted the lower number. You wanted one, one of 200, two of 200. But even if you had the 200th of the 200, that's still pretty prestigious because you can always say there was only 200 made. But when you've got something that's one of 100 billion, what you've got, everybody has, right? I mean, it's not the car that you've got in your garage isn't worth near as much as you think it is if everybody else has got that same car. But now if you've got a car that nobody else has got, then there's going to be worth in it because there's rarity to it. But I begin to think about me. I'm one of 100 billion. Sometimes you all need to tell me when I get a little high on the horse, when I get a little fancy, when I start getting a little arrogant, a little pompous around here, you need to say, preacher, you're one of 100 billion. Sit down. <laughs> and, I'll, <laughs> and I'll do the same for you. 
And, and when you act like you're somebody, I'm going to say, you're one of 100 billion. Sit down. But out of one of 100 billion, does God really know me? I mean, does God really know you when, I, when we say, okay, why are we running from God? Does God really even know me? Why are we throwing up our hands as if we're guilty? Because we are. Why do we do that? Do we really think that God sees every sin? Do we really think that God hears every word? Well, let's go to the Bible. Psalm 139 and verse 6. David makes this statement, a statement that I've needed to make many times in my life. He said, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, it is too high, I cannot attain it. Now, I mean, we've all been there. David was basically saying, I'm not smart enough. I'm not wise enough, I'm not knowledgeable enough to understand. Well, what is it that David was talking about when he said, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, it is too high I cannot attain it. Well, I want you to look. I want you to turn to Psalm 139. You brought your Bible. You brought it for a reason. So turn. Psalm 139. All right? And once you find it, you're going to understand why that David said, when I think about this, I can't understand it because I'm not smart enough. Another little story about Peyton. He's been on a roll this week. And some of you might have seen, he told me the other day, he come home, I said, Peyton, how's your day? He slung that backpack. He said, it wasn't a good day. No, he said, I didn't have a good day. I said, why not? First of all, you're in the third grade. How bad could it be? He said, well, I didn't have a good day. And he slung that backpack down in the house. And as we was going upstairs, I said, why didn't you have a good day? He said, I went to take off my hooded sweatshirt and everything came off. And he says, there I was, no shirt on, in front of everybody. And he said, I had to turn around and put my shirt on. And then he said, we had a lockdown drill, and they turned the lights off, and somebody pinched me, and he told me the place that they pinched him. In other words, he kind of had to go like this. And he said, I got pinched by a girl. And I said, well... Buddy, that sounds like the worst day ever. And, and so, but, <laughs> you know, Peyton's had a lot of worse days. But I, I'm telling you, and there was another story, that, but I better, I better leave Peyton alone because the boys are going to go out and they're going to tell him that I talked to him the whole time. But the other story was is that he told me, he said, Dad, they made a mistake the other day and they gave my class some math for middle school. And he said, I looked at it, and it, it had letters in the math. And he said, I knew that wasn't for us, Dad. That's right. Because that, that's too high for him. He's too, he's too ignorant for that. Now, he'll get there, but David said, I'm too ignorant to understand. What was it that David said, I'm too ignorant to understand? In the first five verses, we find where David said this, The Lord searched me. And knows me. He said in verse 2, God knows my down sitting and my uprising, which means God knows every place I've ever been. He said, Thou understandest my thoughts. God knows every thought I've ever had. Thou compassest my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. Notice this for you blabbers. In verse 4, There is not a word in my tongue that the Lord don't know. Thou hast beset behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. And then he said, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain it. What does that mean? David said, I don't understand it, but God knows every place I've been. He said, he knows every person I've been with. He knows every word I spoke. He knows every thought I've ever had. He knows all my desires, everything about me. God knows more about me than anybody else. And, he, and, and maybe David was thinking the same thing that I was thinking this morning when David thought, well, I'm one in a billion. And you're one in 100 billion, but yet God knows everything about you. Well, here God comes. Matter of fact, before we get there, 
I want you to look at Psalm 51 and verse 4. David said, Against thee, thee only, O Lord, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. David admitted In Psalm 51, that was the psalm that David wrote after his great betrayal. After his great sin. And what was the sin? We all know it was the sin of adultery and deception and lies. And it ended up in murder. And it ended up with a baby dying. I mean, it was a terrible, tragic situation for David. I mean, he made a string of bad choices. And that's what sin will do. Not only will it take you outside of the presence of God, but outside of the presence of God, you don't have the knowledge by which to make a great decision. And David proved that to us. Because my friend, when he turned his back on God and he began to lust after Bathsheba and he went after her and he lied and he had her husband killed and then the baby died, finally, 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 David came back and he penned a psalm that said Psalm 51 and he admitted, God, I was wrong. You want to go over there and read it, you go over there and read it sometime, and I go back to it all the time. But he said, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is ever before me. And we see in that, in verse 4, he said, I have sinned, and I have done this evil in thy sight. See, when you come to God this morning, you don't need to come to God as if God don't know what you've done. You don't need to come to God as if you went out this week and somehow God's forgot about you. God didn't forget about you. God's watched over you. He's watched over me. He's watched over us all. He knows where we've been, what we've done, what we said, what we should have said, what we did do that we shouldn't have done, and what we shouldn't have done that we did do. I mean, God knows it all about all of us. You're one in 100 billion, but God knows about you just like He knows about all the other. 100 billion minus one. I didn't want to do that math right quick. And so the Bible says, against thee, David said, I have sinned. I put there in your notes, in your outlines, you can see we're almost done, but I I said God wasn't on a search as if he didn't know physically where Adam and Eve was. When he said, where are you? It wasn't that he didn't know where they were at. Oh, he knew where they were at. They were hiding in their sin and their shame, and it it was their blame to have. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13 that we ought to examine ourselves. Why examine ourselves? Well, we examine ourselves so that we understand that God knows all about us and there's no need in us trying to hide from Him. We're going to reap what we sow. We've said all of that this morning. So what's the good news? Don't just tell me that I'm separated from God because of my sins. Give me the good news. Oh, the good news is, is that in Isaiah, the Bible said, Come and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Well, how do I get that? How do I get to where one prophet said that God wants to take your sins as far as the east is from the west and remove them from you so that you've got a clean slate? So that you're back in fellowship with God. We also know that the Bible says that we have an advocate with the Father. That when we sin, we can come to Him and seek His forgiveness. And He will not cast us away. And so, the sermon is is that you and I oftentimes have felt like we have a need to hide from God as if we need to run like a kid runs from the parent or a player hides from the referee and throws his hands up. Not me. And yet, we feel like we've got that need to do that with God and I'm trying to tell you that there's no need in doing that. Your running is in vain. Your actions are in vain. God knows where you've been, what you've done. He sees all of us this morning. He knows more about us than we know about ourselves. Every hair on your head is numbered. Numbered by who? Numbered by God. He created you. Do you know that God knew you before your parents knew you? God knew you. Jeremiah was told by God, I knew you before you was in your mother's womb. I knew you. 
I formed you. I created you. And I've given you a job to do. My friend, nobody knows more about you than God. And that, for some of us, is either a really good thing or for some this morning, that could be a really bad thing. Because you know you're living outside of the will of God. And that brings us, you say, well, it's 12 o'clock, it's time to go. No. What that brings us to is an invitation. And the invitation is, if you're outside of the will of God, you don't have to leave that way. You could have come and you know that a sin has separated you from God. You know that uh, you know that something that you've done, something that you've developed, a habit that you now have, that you know you should have got rid of, you know it's there, but you know you've got to get rid of it. And you say, okay, this will be the week that I do it. No, it won't. Everybody gets all been out of shape on Sundays after we've eaten Sunday dinner, we've laid around like beach whales all day. And what happens on Sunday night? i got to start eating better tomorrow. And Monday hits, and you're right back in the biscuits and gravy before you know it. Because you <laughs> it's the loudest amen we've heard all morning just because I said biscuits and gravy. And, 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 and I'm telling you that you could say here this morning, oh, preacher, I'm going to go out and I'm, I'm going to do better. No, you're not going to do anything. You're going to get worse. The only way you can change your life is by coming to the one who can change it. And by surrendering your heart and soul to Christ and saying, I don't want, I don't want this anymore. It's not for me anymore. I want to come back in the good presence of God. So that when God walks in this week, you don't have to throw your hands up. You don't have to run and hide behind the bushes. You don't have to be shameful in your nakedness as Adam was. You can welcome the presence of God. Because He's your God and you belong to Him. And you're living in the will of God. Amen? Stand with us this morning. All over God's house as we give somebody the opportunity to make Jesus Christ.